All right. Well, I think uh, we might begin. I'm, it's uh, welcome. It's my really great privilege to uh, welcome all of you to the 2016 uh, Eason Weinman Lecture on International and Comparative Law. Uh, well more than 100 years ago, uh, Tulane's first president, William Preston Johnson, uh, Johnston, uh, hailed, uh, quote, the science of comparative jurisprudence as the defining strength of Tulane Law School. Uh, and it was the, that strength, he said, that made Tulane unique among all American law schools and one of the nation's finest. Today, in the age of globalization, of course, law schools everywhere uh, in the United States and around the world are scrambling to try to build uh, strength and expertise uh, that crosses boundaries uh, in the law. Uh, yet Tulane staked its leadership on this ground uh, well more than a century ago at a time when most uh, American, most of today's law schools uh, had not yet been founded. In his 1893 commencement address, Professor Johnston recognized that true comprehension of any system of law cannot come uh, solely from within. Instead, uh, he said that the highest insight comes from, quote, looking at any code uh, under which one is to practice from the outside, from the point of view of another body of law. Louisiana, with its distinctive uh, civil code and surrounded by common law neighbors, uh, provided a natural laboratory for Tulane's uh, early strength in comparative law, uh, but it required shrewd leadership and vision to exploit that advantage and develop Tulane's preeminence uh, in a field of growing academic and practical importance. Uh, since 1981, Tulane's leadership in comparative and international law has been sustained and extended through the Eason Weinman Center uh, for International and Comparative Law. Established through the generosity of uh, Ambassador John Giffen Weinman, uh, class of uh, Tulane Law, class of 1952, uh, and his wife, uh, Virginia Eason Weinman. Uh, Ambassador Weinman built an extraordinarily distinguished career uh, on the international stage, uh, first as a uh, partner for nearly 30 years uh, with New Orleans' eminent Phelps Dunbar firm, uh, then as president of the Waverly Oil uh, Corporation, and finally as ambassador to Finland and chief of protocol in the White House. Uh, ambassador and Mrs. Weinman have each served in important leadership roles in higher education. Uh, ambassador Weinman uh, here at Tulane, among many other roles, as the chair of the Tulane University Board of Administrators, uh, and Mrs. Weinman as a trustee of her alma mater, Connecticut College. Uh, the Eason Weinman Center is now recognized uh, internationally uh, for its ambitious research uh, initiatives and as a magnet for scholars uh, and students from around the world, uh, and, uh, and of course for the Eason Weinman Lecture uh, that we uh, gather to celebrate today. The impact of Ambassador and Mrs. Weinman's loyalty uh, to Tulane and their vision uh, of excellence uh, for this institution can be seen uh, in the halls everywhere, uh, here in the halls around us, and literally in those halls, since we, of course, gather in uh, the magnificent Weinman Hall, uh, but also in the Eason Weinman Center and the Eason Weinman Chair, held by our colleague, Professor Guiguo Wong, uh, and, uh, uh, and in the very lifeblood of this institution, uh, given its strength in international comparative law. So we're honored today to be joined by Ambassador and Mrs. Weinman, and uh, please join me in uh, thanking them for their leadership uh, and support. Of this. And with that, I will now turn the podium over to my colleague, uh, Professor Vernon Palmer, the Thomas Pickles Chair of Law. Uh, to introduce our distinguished speaker and a dear friend of Tulane Law School, uh, the Honorable uh, Ian Forrester. In a recent uh, festschrift written by friends in his honor, our speaker tonight was called a Scot without borders or as they may say on the court where he presently sits, uh, an écossais sans frontières. But I'm tempted to give him a more meaningful 
title tonight. Considering that it took him three days to fly from Belgium to reach us, overcoming bombings, closed airports, airplanes leaking oil, and persevering nonetheless, I'm tempted to give him the, the title A Scot Without Wings or The Relentless Scot. He may not have wings, but he certainly has roots, and I'm glad to say New Orleans is one of them and Tulane is one of them. Uh, his resume, his life, uh, his extraordinary career, and the fact that in him, Tulane, Scotland, Brussels, and now Luxembourg, the Luxembourg court, form links in a chain. And all of this makes him a very special and appropriate speaker to deliver the Eason Weinman uh, lecture tonight. Uh, we're not only honored, uh, Ian and Sandra, uh, but truly grateful for your perseverance in overcoming all the obstacles of just getting here. But that's a story unto itself. Um, <clears throat> Our speaker was born in Glasgow, I believe, uh, the youngest son of a respected schoolmaster, I've read. He was educated there uh, and uh, educated at Glasgow University, where I have read he had great success as a debater with, uh, with even the, the late Alan Roger, uh, uh, Lord Roger of Earlsferry, who has been at this podium uh, before. And then more success followed, I understand, in a debating tour in North America, where at some point a very a mysterious force brought him to Louisiana and to New Orleans, where he obtained a Master of Comparative Law. He befriended one of the most famous uh, alumni, uh, alumnus of uh, Tulane Law School, Judge John Minor Wisdom, and he formed a lasting relationship with this law school. I believe he may still be on the Dean's Advisory Council. Um, I know that he has honored us with receptions in Paris through his law firm of White and Case at that time. It's also where he formed a lasting relationship with, I believe, his wife-to-be, um, Sandra Keegan. So our speaker can attest that you can find friendship in New Orleans, but you can also find true love at Tulane. <laughs> what brought him to Louisiana, I'm not sure, but it is something perhaps to do with the fact that he is a Scot, possibly also the intriguing similarities between the Louisiana and Scottish legal systems, perhaps simply his legal curiosity about comparative law, which he certainly has, and Tulane's prominence in that field, as the dean mentioned. Uh, he then worked at uh, the or served an internship at, at the law firm of Davis Polk in New York. He gained admission to the Scots Bar in 1972. He was admitted to the New York Bar in 1977. He was admitted to the English Bar in 1996. He took silk, as they say, which is to say he received the prestigious honor of Queen's Counsel uh, in 1988, and he became a Bencher in Middle Temple in 2012. In 1973, he joined the firm of Cleary Gottlieb and moved to Brussels. Uh, he was apparently one of the first generation of UK lawyers arriving there when the UK joined the European communities. And for the next four decades, Brussels became home. It was where he raised a family with his wife, Sandra, and they had two sons. And by the way, Sandra did not stand idly by. She's here with us tonight. She's a law graduate of uh, Loyola Law School. But then she, in Brussels, uh, led a very distinguished career as a European civil servant at the European Commission, becoming deputy head of the unit <clears throat> from 2000 to 2007. And now, since her PhD has been obtained from Edinburgh, 
I think I should refer to her as Dr. Keegan. Meantime, our speaker created uh, in Brussels the, the firm of Forrester and Noral, which later merged with White and Case. Before he became a judge, his most recent and uh, great honor, uh, he was an expert on European law. It's been said he belongs to the generation that, quote, made the English-speaking competition law bar in Brussels. Until then, it had been a monopoly uh, for a few continental lawyers, apparently, and some Belgian lawyers. He participated in many leading cases which forged key principles of European Union law, particularly competition law. I don't know these cases but, uh, by heart myself, but some in the audience may know the Bosman case on freedom of movement in sport, uh, the G GSK case on parallel trade of pharmaceutical products, uh, landmark cases such as McGill, IMS Health, and of course Microsoft dealing with the interface of competition law and intellectual property law. In an extraordinary combination of careers, um, our speaker not only lived these cases professionally, but he lived them academically, I believe, being a prolific writer of seminal articles. From the Feschrift I mentioned earlier, I decided to count four books, 41 articles, and 62 chapters in books. I could not believe this staggering output, and at the same time leading another life, or perhaps several other lives uh, at, uh, at the same time. Uh, yet amid this long, very dense, uh, and glittering uh, CV, there are still things that could be mentioned that stand out for me. His being, at White and Case, the head of the worldwide pro bono practice program of White and Case. This is a man with a heart, not just a head. His translation of the Bay Gay Bay, the German Civil Code uh, in 1975, and three other books on German law, a cosmopolitan interest in comparative law. His LLD, or his honorary degree from Glasgow, his alma mater. You know, we're usually told that a prophet, uh, no man is a prophet in his own country or in his own town, among his own family, among his own relatives, but in this case, however, uh, he is a prophet recognized in his own country and in his own university. And now in 2015, he has ascended uh, the uh, bench in Luxembourg, the general court of the European Court of Justice. If I were to try to do uh, uh, an introduction any further and to do it properly, um, I think I would leave no time except for question and answer. So and no time for the lecture itself. So I'm not going to try to give a more proper introduction. I'm going to turn it over to our speaker, His Honor, Judge Ian Forrester. Well, it's always a great pleasure to hear one's own obituary. Uh, <laughs> because they're always um, launched in conditions of such enthusiasm and um, unre unreality. Um, uh, thank you for those extravagant words, and I hope you remember them, or your heirs and successors do, when it comes to writing my obituary for print. Um, but I hope there will be a few more paragraphs yet to add. Um, you ask a legitimate question, um, what was it that brought this Scot to Tulane in the first place? And uh, the answer is a very simple, very Scottish one, and uh, I, I will record it. Um, one day in Scotland, 
when I was a callow youth, I was looking for gainful employment and I went to visit a very respectable Edinburgh solicitor. And the very respectable Edinburgh solicitor uh, discovered that I was clean and polite and well-dressed and I didn't, maybe I did have a beard in those days, yes I did, um, but my shirt was clean and my shoes were polished and I did know a little bit about the law and my father had played cricket for Scotland. So what possible further qualifications <laughs> could be required? And uh, he said to me, well, that's excellent, very good, very good. Uh, you could start in September then. And I said, well, yes, certainly, certainly. And we chatted, and then he said, well, I think that's all settled then. And I said, um, uh, there's just the question of salary. And he said, salary? <laughs> and I said, yes, salary? And he said, you mean <laughs> it, <w> it was your expectation, possibly, and I commend your courage for saying this, that at the end of the month um, we would, <laughs> so to speak, advance to you a sum of money. And I said, so stated it seems absurd, but indeed I, I did, um, did har harbour modest aspirations. And he said, well, gosh, it's really very, very brave of you to mention such a thing. Uh, and I will discuss this with my partners, but oh, normally we um, help our young men when they leave us to buy some books for their future practice as advocates at the Scots Bar. So a little bit aghast, I stepped out of uh, that room. And uh, then the very same day I received uh, in... Um, uh, at home in Glasgow a letter from a place called Tulane and Tulane said to me um, we'd like you to come and study law and it's terribly interesting and uh, there's no fees to pay and moreover we'll pay you cash and I thought well um, if I can go to Edinburgh and not be paid but can go to New Orleans wherever, wherever that is and be paid doesn't seem terribly difficult for a Scot to decide uh, which way to go. And uh, that is the true reason that um, I ended up as a Tulane graduate, or at least as a Tulane student. Now, a further corrective to um, put in proper context the extravagant words of Professor Palmer. Uh, he rattled through my professional career, uh, as suggesting that it was immensely successful. Uh, the hideous truth is that since, um, well, if you do antitrust law, this is my uh, apologia, if you do antitrust law in Europe, it isn't uncommon for your clients to be fined. But I hold at the moment the world record for seeing my clients fined astronomical sums of money. <laughs> and um, before I went on the bench, I had just reached three billion with a B euros <laughs> and therefore I assert that I was the most unsuccessful antitrust lawyer <laughs> since the Ten Commandments. <laughs> um, it's also a great pleasure to speak here um, not just because of uh, old friends in the audience and not just because of the pleasures of coming back to a familiar spot but also because I know a number of those who have given this lecture, uh, usually in the presence of um, uh, the Weinmans uh, before, like uh, Judge Baudenbacher, uh, who is the president of the EFTA court, which also sits in Luxembourg. And just two weeks ago, he and Doris told me what a lovely time they had had, how stimulating it was, and what uh, an agreeable uh, professional experience it was. And uh, indeed, as you heard, uh, it was through uh, Tulane that um, I met my wife when it was um, permitted and indeed encouraged for professors to marry their students if they did well in the exams. Um, so my topic for today has been difficult to focus because of the painful events which have afflicted Europe over the past months. And as you will have heard, a week ago yesterday, bombs went off 
in Luxembourg uh, planted by demented and misguided individuals. One went off at the metro station beside our house and I know two people who were on that train, happily not in the fatal carriage. Um, our travel here was uh, disrupted, is a gentle word, uh, because of the destruction of part of Brussels Airport. That's a punctuel particular event. But we also know that Europe has been going through existential crises um, greater than any that I can remember. Uh, the refugee crisis, the uncertainty about the future of the Eurozone, um, and uh, last but perhaps worst, certainly not least, uh, the suggestion of a Brexit, a British exit from the European Union. So that made the preparation of my remarks this evening uh, quite difficult because I wasn't sure what this audience would like to discuss. So what I have um, planned to do is to say something about the working of the court in which I sit, which is unique in the world, um, and then to talk about two areas of substantive law where American courts and, and litigants uh, and European courts and litigants address problems differently but not completely differently or similarly but not completely similarly. That is to say in the field of antitrust and in the field of measures to hinder terrorism. So those are my three substantive thoughts, topics, so to speak. But let me begin by reminding us, especially at these times, of why it was that the European Union was created. It was created in order to make war impossible. It was created in order to eliminate the age-old tension between Germany and France and England. If you had asked my father in, say, 1950, will there be another war in Europe? He would have said, and he was a teacher of history, every 30 years, somewhere, Europe goes to war. So that massive achievement, that, that rewriting of the slope of history re-engineering of the slope of history is the first and for me the greatest achievement of the European Union. The land boundaries, the political boundaries and the ethnic boundaries of Europe do not correspond. If you draw a map of where the Catholics live or the French speakers live or the Hungarian minority lives uh, or the Gallic speakers live, um, Whatever way you care to draw the line, they never correspond to the political boundaries. And therefore, Europe must coexist and Europeans must live together. And that is the great achievement of the first 30 years of the European adventure. And then I suggest the next great achievement was demonstrating to Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Communist Europe, that prosperity, coexistence, friendship could bring prosperity and that democracy and prosperity could live and could live together and that the one fostered the other. And so the bringing down of the, of the Berlin Wall had many causes, but one of them was the, prosper, the prosperous success of the European Union. So the history of the creation of the European Union, the European Community as it was called, is attributed particularly to, to two men, one especially Schumann, who grew up in what was then Germany, in Metz. He became a member of the bar, at the German bar. He served in the German army. And then, by the fortunes of the peace treaty, he became French. And he was arrested by the Gestapo in the Second World War, and at the end of the war at Liberty, started planning the elimination of war in Europe. That was a true European. And the institutions 
were created um, by a small number of talented, visionary individuals in the late 40s and early 50s. First, the coal and steel community to take out of the hands of money makers and put in the hands of a high authority the way to make weapons out of steel. Um, and then, more ambitiously, the creation of an economic community that would uh, be based upon the four freedoms of persons, capital, um, goods, and services. Now, the, when we talk of community law or union law these days, we speak about the law established by the Treaty of Rome, which was negotiated in Brussels, in Val Duchesse, in 1956 and 57. And uh, the, the archives are now open, you can see them. Uh, in the early days, it was six countries trying to negotiate a means of working together that would eliminate war and offered the opportunity of building a single market which would deliver prosperity. Now, subsequent to that, in addition to the single market, the policies of the European Union include a slew of other things, food safety, child um, abduction, um, private international law, migration, international trade, dumping, technical regulations, uh, pharmaceutical safety, uh, a, a massive range of subjects, where indeed it is difficult for judges to see the single way ahead. In the old days, if we were talking free movement of goods, let's say, and the Dutch required a particular chemical to be used in cheese, but the Germans forbade that particular chemical. What should happen to the principle of free movement of goods? Should the product be able to cross a frontier or not? The United States, of course, had a, a unified market. Europe did not. And so the European court, in a succession of judgments, generally gave a longer leash to the European Commission and a shorter one, less tolerance to the member states. Now, moving forward, 50 years, 40 years forward, we are in a situation where constitutional power is in a constantly shifting triangle of forces um, between the member states and the European Council. Each government has legitimacy through the ballot box. The, um, uh, so it's 28 cooperating sovereign nations looking for their advantage. Um, the European Parliament, uh, the democratic authority of the ballot box again, and the fundamental principles uh, supported, pursued, advocated for by the European Commission as guardian of the treaty. And these forces shift constantly depending on the crisis, depending on the country, depending on the political climate. Now, the courts have limited jurisdiction and uh, therefore limited jurisdiction is limited jurisdiction and it's prescribed by the member states who are treaty makers, who appoint the judges, who hold the purse strings, who are political actors that often fail to act. So member states sometimes say, I will, but they don't. Um, and who control the resources as well as being legislators at home. So the courts are there to answer the questions that come to them, but have no wider jurisdiction than that which is accorded uh, by the treaties. So the Treaty of Rome and the subsequent Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union and all the treaties in between um, conceive of a judicial architecture where there will be two big categories of court case. One category is questions referred by national courts to the Court of Justice. Um, uh, this person 
is the illegitimate son of a Belgian citizen born in a third country, now living uh, in uh, Europe. He is married to a Colombian national. She is to be deported under ta 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 ta. But is the uh, unity of the family such that uh, her deportation is contrary to community law? That's a question, and I'm stating it badly, that could come from a Belgian court asking the European court for guidance on the principle of European law to be followed. Second uh, category of um, uh, case, uh, which is the one that my court, the general court, handles, would be appeals against decisions of EU organs. And that could be the Commission imposing an antitrust fine on Microsoft. It could be a decision of the food agency saying that a particular chemical is unacceptable to be used as an additive. It could be a decision to impose anti-dumping duty on Chinese bicycles. It could be a wide range of topics, or it could relate to intellectual property, the grant or not grant by the trademark office of a European trademark. Um, or, as we'll hear, it could be uh, a challenge to an asset freeze imposed on someone who was thought to be uh, uh, a supporter of terrorism. Um, one of the weaknesses, one of the problems that we have at the moment is that the constitutional architecture of Europe is not as clear and as persuasive, as understandable for the ordinary citizen or for this citizen um, as it should be. And so Europe is faced with a constitutional crisis and it, its um, imperfect constitutional structure is creaking at the moment. Now, that doesn't make any the less important, I hope, the judicial role. And uh, I was um, uh, surprised in, it was actually when I was in New Orleans last year, um, to receive a phone call saying that I had been uh, nominated by the UK government to be the next UK judge on the court. And so I was sworn in uh, in October, and I have found it utterly fascinating uh, since then. So uh, a little bit about the court. Uh, Luxembourg wasn't expected to be the site of the European courts or institutions. Uh, Liège was one candidate, and Brussels was another, and the six member states were slugging it out uh, late, late, late into the night. And as Schumann wrote in his diary, at six o'clock in the morning, owing to general exhaustion, an outsider won this derby. Luxembourg! Exclamation mark. So this was in 1952 when the court began its activities. And in those days, um, they, it was a modest two houses side by side where all that was necessary for the, uh, for the court's uh, institutions. Um, today, there are um, 1,000, I'm sorry, there's 2,200 staff at the court, um, and I believe that I am the 69th member of that court. Um, and uh, for the moment, at least, um, we are um, coping with uh, a caseload of, of all the courts which are in, the, in Luxembourg, that's to say the, the Court of Justice of the European Union, the General Court, the Tribunal, and the, uh, the Civil Service Tribunal for pension claims and claims against the institutions. Those three courts working together under the umbrella of the Court of Justice receive about 1,700 to 2,000 cases per year. Now, language, there were six member states at the beginning, Italy, France, Germany, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Belgium, I think that's six, 
and um, the uh, French was a, a working language, a, 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 na a national language of three countries, and it was also the language of diplomacy. So French was adopted as the uh, langue de travail, the working language uh, of the court. And that has had, still has, a big significance for, uh, for the work of the court, in that the court has a large number of traditions which are uh, very familiar to French administrative lawyers. And all correspondence between judges is done in French, and the délibéré, when there's no interpreters present, the judges speak French. And fluency in French is one of the requirements to be appointed, and there's a committee of seven chief justices who meet candidates in private and interrogate them, and they interrogate them both in English and in French, and a number of candidates have been shot down because their French wasn't good enough. Now, in the early days of the court, uh, 37, there were 80 cases in, I think, eight years. 37 were in French, 23 in Italian, 17 in German, and three in Dutch. Okay? That's in the 1950s. Last year, 2015, of the cases brought before the general court, that's my court, 43% were brought in English, 11% in French, 15 in German, and 12 in Spanish. We have 23 uh, languages. That's to say, if you wish to bring an action in Greek, or Lithuanian, or Estonian, or Finnish, or English, you can do so. Um, the text will be translated into French, and um, the judges will deliberate between themselves in French, but the correspondence in the case directed to the parties will be in Estonian, if it's in Estonian, and the oral argument will be conducted in Estonian, except for the member states who have the privilege of speaking their own language. Now, that may sound extraordinarily difficult and implausibly, improbably challenging. In fact, last uh, two weeks ago, I sat in a case with a Cypriot judge and a Lithuanian judge, and uh, the language of the case was Spanish, and there was therefore interpretation into Lithuanian, Greek, Spanish, there was a German intervention, um, and, uh, and English. And it was remarkably good, really, really remarkably good. Uh, as long as the lawyers are slow and focus on the big principles and arm the interpreters in advance with knowledge of what they're going to talk about. Uh, I'll mention one piece of reform about the court, which may be of interest. Uh, during the period... So, we started with six member states. In 1973, the number grew to nine with the arrival of the UK, Ireland, and Denmark. And then uh, it grew gradually to 15, and in 2004, it grew to 25. And then it's now 28. So of those 28 countries, 12 are former uh, communist, socialist countries. And so uh, my colleagues include colleagues who have known friends who've been imprisoned, friends who have died during political violence, and colleagues who have been subject to political censorship, who could tell the climate of the times by how much of their written work was purged by a censor, or how little, and you could gauge the nervousness of the political leadership of the party by how much of your writings would undergo the blue pencil of the censor. So, um, their arrival changed enormously the flavor of the working of the court. Uh, and each of them has a story of personal bravery uh, that's extraordinary. However, um, it, by 2010, the court was going very slowly. And as a response to this, it was decided by the member states that the court should be increased in number. And as a result of that, during 
the next um, few months, there will be 12 new judges appointed uh, from 12 countries chosen at random, and then the judges in the Civil Service Tribunal will be added to our court. Now, among the questions for the court in the future are, should we sit regularly as three judges, or should we sit as five, as a general practice? Um, five judges means more debate. Does it mean better quality? Will it slow us down? The, the vote has been that it will be five judges. How do we reconcile the need for judicial review of legality, administrative law standards, with the, um, uh, the fact that the, the treaty didn't establish full jurisdiction on the merits uh, for certain areas of activity, like antitrust? Um, and then how do we treat old cases, classic competition cases from the 1970s, which are greatly respected, were greatly respected, but maybe are a wee bit old-fashioned today. Um, those are questions which we are debating. And the last one is, how could our court assist the Court of Justice in coping with its caseload? Are there categories of case which could be removed from the docket of the Court of Justice and given to the General Court? Um, so let me now... Uh, before passing on, I'll just mention two things which should give pleasure to a legal audience, and that is professional negligence. Um, there is a case, a decision uh, of the French Cour de Cassation, which ruled in favour of an elderly, well, I presume he was elderly, um, uh, uh, client who was objecting to the fact that he'd been um, subject to dismissal or he'd lost his job because of his age and with my grey hair um, I'm always sympathetic to such claims and uh, uh, there is a judgment of the Court of Justice which precisely addressed his problem but his lawyer didn't mention it and when the client heard of this the client went to court against the lawyer and to my surprise the the, um, uh, the Cour de Cassation said that um, the lawyer had been in breach of his devoir de compétence, his duty of um, efficiency or competence, and uh, the client got 59,000 euros of damages. Um, so the, the European courts, courts plural, have said on repeated occasions that the Treaty of Rome and its successors established a complete system of legal remedies and procedures designed to permit the Court of Justice to review the legality of measures adopted by the, by the institutions. So the Court said in easier, happier times, the Treaty establishes a system of legal remedies which is truly complete. Now, that, um, that assertion is presenting a challenge for the courts in particular cases. Um, and um, I'm happy to address this uh, in, in questions in more detail. But for the moment, the individual, let's say you are a manufacturer or your client is a manufacturer of cheese, and uh, a new rule on additives is adopted and your client thinks that's crazy um, and your client wasn't asked and your client is uniquely affected because it's the only one that offers in Ireland goat and cow's milk in cheese together. And um, your client comes and says, what can I do to challenge this? Well, there's two routes. One is to go directly to Luxembourg and uh, seek to challenge the measure on the grounds that it is of direct and individual concern. And the other is to go to court in Ireland and persuade the Irish judge that there's a real problem here and ask the Irish judge to make a reference to Luxembourg. Now the rules for that are, that's to say the, the rules for direct actions are very tight and um, 
I think it's too technical in the time available to address in much detail. But if there's questions, I'd be happy to talk about them. But um, what I think is, is relevant uh, is that uh, the European courts are aware of the problem that the powers of the European institutions are very great and there is a danger for individual citizens and individual economic operators that they may not be able to get adequate judicial review unless they're very lucky uh, in, in Luxembourg. Now, let's pass to two substantive areas of the law. Um, despite the political uncertainties, European substantive law has continued to prosper and to develop. And I'll say a few words, first of all, about uh, antitrust. Now, <clears throat> we're, uh, the Sherman Act was adopted about 125 years ago. And although we may think, we may say, that, and it's true, America has had uh, a very successful antitrust law, competition law, which has lasted 125 years. In fact, in the first 50 and more years, the Sherman Act, the antitrust law, was applied in a manner quite, quite different to what we would regard as a normal or appropriate or predictable today. And I'll mention a few differences with, with Europe. Uh, and a few similarities. Uh, a big difference was that America already had an integrated market. Uh, it wasn't necessary to use the antitrust law to open up the border between Nevada and California. It was easy to trade <coughs> across that so-called frontier. But in Europe, uh, very differently, as we'll see. On the other hand, the American antitrust law um, was targeted at uh, matters which today would be regarded as kind of old-fashioned, like protecting the small guy against the big guy. Um, uh, yes, standing up to monopoly power, yes, standing up to abuses of power is one of the classic goals of uh, antitrust law in Europe, in America, around the world. But the climate in which it was applied in the United States, the way in which it was applied was much more populist than would be the case today or would be the case in the 1970s. So modern notions of antitrust law as a way to generate economic efficiency in order to deliver consumer welfare in the form of better goods at lower prices, that notion is really quite, and I'm exaggerating a bit, is really quite recent in American antitrust law. Now, if we look at the European side, European governments often regarded their co companies as national champions. Uh, even if you suspect strongly that your company, your friendly oil company, your friendly plastics company, is engaging in imprudent conversations with its French and German and Italian counterparts, and even if it's sort of well known, don't touch it because it's my national champion. And so European antitrust law focused not on cartels, although there were plenty in the 60s, 70s and, 70s and 80s, but rather on the building of a common market. Again, I'm exaggerating, and there are, of course, exceptions. Um, the Europe definitely lacked a single market and creating one was a shared aspiration of the founding fathers and it was desired that um, there should be, uh, it should not be possible for private contractual obstacles to trade between member states to replace the uh, government obstacles which were gradually being eliminated by governmental action required by the Treaty of Rome. So um, the negotiators of the treaty who drafted the competition rules were really like babes in the woods. They were worried about, among other things, religious discrimination as a factor of competition. And a number of concerns 
which would today seem to us quite bizarre. And anyway, the, the, the treaty that was produced, Articles 85 and 86 in those days, has been imitated, duplicated around the world by more than 100 countries. That's to say, Europe's competition rules have been copied, or almost copied, by, I guess, 110 com countries around the world. So it has been a success in terms of its concept. Now, the actual enforcement and application uh, has been the subject of very intense negotiation and cooperation between Washington and Brussels over the years. Now, the strange thing is that uh, during the early days, American enforcement of the rules against cartels was a source of tension and jurisdictional rivalry. American cowboys coming, chasing honest European businessmen. Um, never women, always men. Um, true, don't know why. Um, well, one could speculate, but that's to take one off course. Uh, that phenomenon of rivalry with respect to antitrust enforcement changed enormously in the early 90s when two things happened. There was the adoption of what we might call positive comity and an understanding that I'll enforce my competition rules in my country and you enforce your competition rules against your people in your country and let's cooperate. And no longer do you need to worry about encroachments on your sovereignty when the Department of Justice comes banging on doors, metaphorically speaking, in your country. That was one huge change. And the second huge change, which expanded the, um, the, uh, the, the, the fight against cartels, was the adoption of uh, a leniency program. Those who confess don't go to jail. Those who confess and tell the full details of what's been going on don't go to jail, uh, don't pay a fine or get a lower fine. And those two programs have been enormously successful. So in the field of cartels, there is very, very strong parallelism today between what's going on in the United States and what's going on in Europe and very strong uh, cooperation. On the other hand, um, we can see that in substantive law, there's a range of situations. For example, European law uh, is very harsh on those who give, in a dominant position, who give discounts linked to loyalty. American antitrust law uh, does not have that concern to anything like the same degree. Um, that's one uh, disparity. Uh, another one relates to the compulsory licensing of technology. If you compare the European Microsoft case and the US Microsoft case, you'll see a very big uh, difference. And vertical distribution. The United States says broadly, with exceptions, let market forces prevail. Europe is much more conservative, much more anxious about uh, disparities which might amount to hindrances to trade between member states. Then there's some common concern, that's to say anxiety about standard essential patents. If um, the technology for a, a, an electronic watch, this is a mechanical one, but uh, if there's a patent in here, which, for example, connects to the telephone, um, and that patent has been granted to an individual who's pleased to see his technology being used, but then says to his rivals or his competitors, if you want to use this technology, you must pay me an arm and a leg. Uh, that problem has arisen in the United States. That problem has arisen in Europe. And broadly, there's a, there's a, a commonality of approach and concern. And then there's another area, which is often called pay for delay, where we can see on both sides of the Atlantic some divergence and some convergence. That's an extremely hasty bird's eye view of um, the law or disparities in the law, divergences in the law regarding antitrust. Let me end in the last couple of minutes uh, to reassure Vernon lest he um, 
hold up a sign saying portion control. Um, um, uh, I'll say a word about uh, a saga relating to um, terrorism. And the, the individual is called Yassin Abdullah Qadi. And if you saw his picture, and you can, you can Google him, uh, he looks a bit like Omar Sharif, elegant, smooth, prosperous, well-dressed, very articulate, um, very good English, a prosperous Saudi national who is a giant businessman with a turnover of millions and billions. He gave help to uh, Bosnian Muslims during the Yugoslav Wars. Another person who gave help to Bosnian mu Muslims during the Yugoslav Wars was Osama bin Laden. And um, I am speaking prudently, I hope, uh, because there are numerous litigations ongoing regarding uh, asset freezes. But the Qadi case is, I believe at the moment, at an end. So Mr. Qadi was put, you'll recollect, 9-11-2001. In the days after that, a number of um, individuals were identified, put on a United Nations list, and the obligation of any signatory of the UN Charter um, was to implement asset freezes on these individuals. Mr. Qadi was such a person. And um, he said, uh, and then uh, those on the list are targeted by European Union measures, European community in those days. And um, Mr. Caddy went to court and he said, uh, you're completely mistaken, there's no evidence against me, I've seen no adequate file, my name is on the list, my name should not be on the list, it is a mistake. Um, and the, at first instance, before my court, uh, he lost um, because, roughly speaking, the court said, we understand what you're anxious about, but there's nothing we can do because public international law is an obligation of all member states, all members of the European uh, community, now European Union, all of them are bound by the obligations of the uh, of. Of, of the United Nations, we can't help. And um, there might have been a question of use cogens if the UN measures involved torture or something of that sort, but it, it didn't arise. So the unavailability of a remedy for Mr. Qadi was a natural consequence of compliance with public international law. Okay, that's Qadi 1, round 1. Caddy won round two was when Mr. Caddy appealed against the judgment of the General Court to the Court of Justice. And the judges of the European Court of Justice departed from classic deference to public international law. It's probably relevant that this coincided in time with debate about Guantanamo Bay, debate about the invasion of Iraq, um, a lack of confidence perhaps in the international public international law system in any event instead of acting as a deferential judicial body saying United Nations says that our hands are tied the European court as, as they put it acted as a constitutional court and examined the extent to which the measures imposed on Caddy and the circumstances imposed uh, uh, and the circumstances in which those measures were imposed were constitutional, were acceptable as a matter of his fundamental rights uh, under the uh, Human Rights Convention. So the court annulled the EU sanctions against Mr. Cadi, and they said the fact that Mr. Cadi and the courts, the court below, didn't have access to the information and evidence relied on against him constitutes an infringement of the rights of the defense and the right to eff uh, effective judicial uh, protection. The, U the sanctions committee should provide as much detail as possible on the basis for the listing, 
the nature of the information and supporting information. Respect for the rights of defence and the right to effective judicial protection requires that the competent authority disclose to Mr. Qadi the evidence against him. Um, then the competent authority must ensure he's placed in a position to make known his views, and so on and so on. Um, to that end, it's for the courts of the European Union, in order to carry out that examination, to request the Commission, when necessary, to produce information relevant to such an examination. If that material is insufficient to allow a finding that a reason is well-founded, the court shall disregard, disregard that reason as a possible basis for the contested decision. Such a judicial review is indispensable to ensure a fair balance between the maintenance of international peace and security and the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms of the person concerned. And one can see echoes of Korematsu against the United States. So the, um, uh, the measures were annulled by the uh, Court of Justice. Then further measures were applied to Mr. Qadi. He came back to court again, and uh, the lower court, my court, said, hmm, well, hmm. Um, uh, in general, this is the court being rather skeptical, this is before my time. Um, the fact remains that a review of the legality of a community act which merely implements a UN resolution, normally uh, there's, no, there's no possibility for divergence. And then it lists some of the criticisms that could be made and the general court acknowledges those criticisms of the judgment of the ECJ are not, without, are not entirely without foundation. However, the appellate principle itself and the hierarchical judicial structure, which is, the, is its corollary, generally advise against the general court revisiting points of law which have been decided by the Court of Justice. In other words, okay, we're not really so convinced, but we'll go ahead uh, and obey what the Court of Justice says. And moreover, they say, in the scale of a human life, 10 years represents a substantial period of time, and the question of the classification of the measures uh, as criminal now seems to be open. There was no file to examine, there was no available evidence, and um, uh, the lower court, um, the general court, annulled the measures against Mr. Cuddy. Then there was another appeal to the Court of Justice, which took a less radical position and said, um, and I'm summarizing a longer story, that uh, respect for the rights of the defense requires that someone like Mr. Cuddy must be given sight of the case against him. And um, we are now working on a system a little bit like special advocates. That's to say that it might be that the individual may not be shown the damaging information based on hearsay or acu personal accusations against him. The individual may not be shown that, uh, but his uh, special advocate may be. And so the courts are, the Luxembourg courts, are working on establishing new rules which will make it possible for very, very sensitive information to be kept under exceptionally severe um, uh, guard uh, and may be consulted by judges in the course of a future case. Um, now, uh, and again, the outcome of that uh, case was that um, <coughs> the, uh, the sanctions imposed on Mr. Cardi have been lifted. And in addition, a UN ombudsman has been established, special advocates have been appointed, and there is uh, a, some greater sense of um, respect for fairness to the rights and interests uh, of the individual. Um, so, what have I been saying? The court is a part of the architecture 
established by the founders of the European Union uh, 60 years ago, working in Brussels and signing the treaties in Rome and Paris. The imperfections of the constitutional architecture of the European Union don't diminish the need for good judicial oversight of administrative action. And one of the fascinating things about working in the court is seeing the different approaches of different nationalities to the job of judicial review. That is utterly fascinating. And one can see wide divergences between what an Irish judge, a Finnish judge, and a Slovak judge would say, by way would have as general approach to the um, uh, to a, 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 a question. Now, we have got in the general court the task of reviewing administrative action, and we have to reconcile speed and quality. We have ideally to deliver quality at high speed, but with um, voluminous pleadings and sometimes because of the slowness of, of translation, that can take some time. That is a considerable challenge. On the other hand, I say this slowly and clearly, the courts are aware of the criticisms that have been made of them and the courts are absolutely aware of the fact that especially at a time of political difficulty the judicial voice is an important one. Now I have been in rooms in Tulane Law School since 1969 when we discussed the grundig Conson case um, which was at the very beginning um, interesting and surprising and has in the intervening 40 years become venerable and classic. Um, I want to repeat how much fun I have had uh, as a Tulane lawyer over the intervening 40-something years. Um, I had the privilege, as Vernon Palmer mentioned, of knowing John Wisdom, and I well recollect that I was summoned by the fierce but kind um, Bonnie Wisdom to dinner at the Wisdom Mansion and I arrived at exactly one minute before the appointed hour not more not less and we had a splendid meal and Judge Wisdom was reminiscing about Huey Long, about Eisenhower about many many other things and at the end of dinner uh, he said to his daughter Kit, take this young man to the Napoleon house and buy him a Sazerac <laughs> and uh, there's ten dollars and Kit and I went off to um, have um, a Sazerac I suppose though I, I do have a taste for Sazeracs but I can't tell whether we did have a Sazerac and whether we had it at the Napoleon house but that was one of many charming and enjoyable evenings where the law Tulane Louisiana and alcohol coincided <laughs> and uh, so I would like to say once more thanks to our uh, Dean, thanks to the endower of these lectures and thank you to Vernon for being so kind and generous. to separate my previous 40 years as a practitioner uh, from, the, um, from the different challenge of deciding uh, who's right in a, in a competition appeal. 
Um, that is a very fair question. And uh, in the when after you're nominated as a as a candidate by a member state, the seven chief justices, six chief justices plus a parliamentarian, question you for an hour and a half, and that was one of the questions. Um, it's uh, I I think I would say it's less difficult than I expected. Um, uh, I do try to be prepared with questions for both sides. Um, there aren't, there have not been so many uh, competition questions, um, competition cases before the court. Uh, following um, the previous commissioner had the practice of settling cases rather than deciding them with a condemnation, and so there aren't so many competition cases in our docket, but there are a few. And uh, it's fun to discuss them with other judges. Um, I don't know anything about the case, but I do know the questions which would arise. And um, uh, it's tricky, but it's, I would say, not quite as difficult as I thought. The temptation is a little bit to be the advocate of one side or the other. Um, trying to help one side who isn't doing so well. And that's not what the judge is meant to do. You're meant to sit and listen and um, uh, decide once you've heard both both sides. Again, there's a, a difference in tradition. Uh, a Lithuanian judge or a French judge would not ask a question which might hint at the way the judge was thinking. If the judge felt... Um, <coughs> In, in the tradition, in the common continental tradition, um, the judge should ask a question which is really a question. Um, can you show me where on page 17 you find authority for the proposition? Da, 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 da? Um, that's a question. But a question like uh, an Anglo-Saxon judge would say, surely, Miss Smith, you're not saying tum, 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 tum. Um, well, the Irish and the, and the UK judge ask such questions, and the other judges find it interesting, <laughs> a wee bit surprising, but they know that the Brits have their strange habits. I think one thing that confuses some Americans looking at the European system is the distinction between the different European courts talk a little bit about the European Union courts versus the European Court of Human Rights and the distinction between those two very different systems. And now that the, the EU has its charter that's supposed to incorporate and be consistent with the European Convention, do you see um, any potential for, has there been any sort of conflict or inconsistency with how the ECJ is interpreting those rights versus the ECHR? Only a serious teacher of law could ask such a uh, deadly question <laughs> so well focused. Um, it's not a deadly question. It's a, it's a highly relevant question. Okay, some definitions. Um, the Council of Europe established uh, in Strasbourg uh, the Human Rights Commission and Court, now the Human Rights Court. That court... Uh, has as signatories Turkey, Serbia, Russia, Moldova, uh, some 50-odd countries. And um, uh, they, the, the judges uh, have an enormous caseload, an enormous backlog, uh, over 100,000 cases. So, yes, 100,000 cases. So um, the job for the judges and the staff is to find the cases which well present interesting issues um, requiring deserving uh, judicial attention. And so there was one yesterday that Sandra pointed out uh, involving the accidental shooting of a terrorist suspect who was completely innocent by armed police in England. Um, it wasn't an accidental shooting. They intended to shoot him, and they did, and they got the wrong man. 
um, and it was held by the European Human Rights Court who had selected that case from the thousands of others as presenting an important point of principle that um, uh, there had not been a breach of the Human Rights Convention by the UK police. Now, um, there's another case which involves the link between Strasbourg and Luxembourg and the, the institutions of the European Union. There, an aircraft, it's called the Bosphorus case, an aircraft was being serviced in Ireland and the aircraft was, as it were, wanted because of Yugosla Yugoslav sanctions. The owner of the aircraft, uh, the, 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 the holder of title to the aircraft, and the beneficial owner were different. And the beneficial owner, and again I'm being very, prim I'm, I'm not, um, this, is a, this is a simplification of a much longer, more complicated story. The beneficial owner lost his, his aircraft and uh, lost, uh, lost because of the principle in public international law that if the United Nations has said it, then there's nothing more to be done. And the case went to the uh, Human Rights Court in Strasbourg as to whether the European Union institutions had or had not respected the property interests of the beneficial owner. And the, court of the, the Human Rights Court said, and again I'm simplifying, uh, said the European Union has a good reputation in terms of respecting individual rights of property and other things. And we are not going to, at this stage, we're not going to find a violation. And the Bosphorus case is a strong endorsement by the Human Rights Court of the respect that the, um, that the European Union institutions have for fundamental rights. Now, if you look at the Cadi cases, you can see this uh, uncertainty. Is it acceptable uh, to say the United Nations has told us to do it? You are innocent. You're going to lose your property. Um, and that's just tough because we must do what the United Nations has to say. Um, or are, if the Bosphorus case were to arise again, would the beneficial owner in the European Union come out better? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Now, more recently, in December 14, there was the rendering of an opinion by the European Court of Justice, who was asked, which was asked to opine on whether the accession by the EU to the Human Rights Convention was acceptable or not. And I think it's fair to say that there was considerable surprise when the Court of Justice in Luxembourg said that the terms of the proposed accession were unacceptable because it should be the final arbiter on compliance. And so uh, the debate goes on as to what is the exact relationship between the human rights authorities and the European Union authorities with respect for fundamental rights. There's a number of questions where um, uh, fair trial in antitrust cases, um, right to property in sanctions cases, and maybe one or two other examples where there might be a tension between what the EU court and authorities have done and what the Strasbourg authorities have upheld. It's a very nice question, and if you have a PhD candidate who's really talented, you should encourage her to write a PhD on that <laughs> subject. Well, thank you very much. This has been delightful. There's a reception to follow in the NPR room.